Welcome to Nachtwaffen Pilot with Penny Bradley. Today's guest is Matt Tracy. He's returning to continue his talk about the German engines. Um, I haven't given him a bio before, and I don't have one written in front of me. So this is what I know of Matt Tracy for new listeners. Matt Tracy was adopted by a, an alpha drac whose name was Jurakan, and he was trained along with Jurakan's own children in the draconian methods of both psionics and warfare. He's an accomplished warrior in the Draco auxiliary and he has served with several of the folks that I've interviewed before including Will Glover and the man calling himself Yakarta. <clears throat> um, there was someone named Kat who also served with them. Uh, he has recovered memories of serving as a an engine engineer with the German fleet called Nachtwaffen. And in the here and now, he and I have been friends for what, five years now? Something like that? Yeah, sounds about right. So um, he's from Louisiana and he's one of the more stable persons in our community. Uh, his altars so far have not been violent people. So uh, I'm honored to have him on my show. Welcome, Matt. Hey. Oh, it's good to be here. Oh, um, you said we were going to talk about the German engines this time. Yeah. You did you did a lot of the background of um, the German version of science in our first interview on my radio show. And then the next time you had trouble getting into that altar. And so we talked about Jurakan and the Dr Draconian military auxiliary. So you want to go into just enough to continue the story? Um, yeah, I'll kind of touch base on a little bit of the um, previous info. Uh, basically, um, I don't have full recall of any of my service times, any of my altars. I do have recall here and there. Um, and uh, part of that recall is of working in what seems to be like an R&D project. We're working on um, new designs for the engines and stuff that they're using, that they're building when they're new ships these days. Um, or it could even be years from now, you know, given that they age regress us and send us back all depends on how long I was in service with them. Um, makes sense. I don't actually remember being taught the science. I know I was. I, I know I was taught a lot. I've been using um, stuff here that I'm learning to trigger memory recall of what I know out. What I know that I know out there. And uh, the only things that are close enough to the knowledge out there that are triggering these memories is literally throwing away all the hugabaloo jargon that's being taught today mm -hmm. and going back to before the Germans left Earth. Yeah, I know in my, my memories as a navigator, it was really clear that they had tossed out anything having to do with Einstein's relativity and that they were, they were working from electric universe 
and quantum mechanics combined. Correct. They were basically attacking quantum mechanics from a more a higher resolution understanding of electricity. And they were focusing on the you know quantum realm as being phenomenon spawned from the same things that electricity spawns from. Um, for instance, gravity is, well, before I get into that, correct some things I said last time, you know, we already talked about this. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. Um, for I, the audience, sometimes you'll remember an overview and as you remember more detail, it changes the picture. Right. Sometimes a lot. Well, the modern day mainstream understanding of what voltage and amperage is and what magnetism and dielectricity is, um, is obscured and wrong. And that kind of mixed in with my studies, um, you know, and I had some misconceptions there, which I've rectified. I previously said that um, voltage is the dielectric and amperage is the magnetic component that's actually completely reversed. Okay. Voltage is the magnetic component within the electric circuit. Amperage is the dielectric component. Voltage is the measurement of the magnetic lines of force that's running outside of the wire, creating a field wrapping around the wire. Mm -hmm. Out into space, the higher the voltage, the further the distance you can, you can detect it away from the wires. Um, amperage is that dielectric lines of force which more connect um, rather than wrapping around back in on themselves like a magnetic lines of force does they terminate on other objects like other one atom will term that dielectric force line will terminate on another atom the groups of them one wire will those lines of force will terminate on the other adjacent wire. They stay inside that little zone of space. They don't radiate out. Magnetic lines of force will radiate out and then uh -huh. literally loop back that, in. On that's itself. why the amperage is the one that can kill you is because it concentrates in that smaller space. Right, right. Um, so now that we've corrected that understanding, the German understanding of gravity is, if you look back at the atom, how the positive voltage is at its core and the negative voltage is at a surrounding field surrounding the core. Uh -huh. Well, the mass is actually defined Mass is how strongly gravity, how much an object will weigh, how strongly gravity affects that object. Lower the mass, the lighter the object. Greater the mass, the heavier the object is. Well, this is because of the ratio between that negative terminal, or I should say negative um, conductor field, and then the positive conductor field as those ratios change, the gravity, the effect of gravity changes with this object. Mm -hmm. uh, you could actually repeat this in a macro scale. Uh, if you took a sphere conductor, coated it thickly with a uh, insulative material, and then created another sphere outside of that, and if you took the outer larger sphere being the negative terminal and the inner sphere being the positive terminal, you're basically you're creating a capacitor, a mm -hmm. spherical capacitor. But the inner sphere is smaller than the outer sphere. This is an asymmetric capacitor. 
Mm -hmm. The force of the, the gravity will actually move towards the positive terminal. And if, and as far out as that voltage field that you're going to create uh, reaches out is how far that gravity field is going to affect objects around it. If you put a million volts through this thing and pulse it, it has to be direct current. It can't be alternating current because okay. you can't have, it has to, the outer larger sphere has to be negative and the inner smaller sphere has to be positive. They can't And alter, alternating current actually flips it them. Switch. It flips between positive and negative. The two yeah. terminals flip. It has to be direct current. You create a standing direct current and then you use something akin to a spark gap or it could be anything else like that that simply creates a compressive force down the wire, a pulse. Mm -hmm when that pulse of increased density of the current of the voltage and current um, hits the conductor for that moment that that increased density of that current is is in place everything within that field is just going to like yeah. gravity moving towards the um, that capacitor yeah um thomas townson brown did linear capacitors where he just had a um, plate and then a smaller plate and the objects moved towards the smaller plate. Um, so that's basically what that is. All gravity based engines do this in different ways. They're creating this asymmetrical field between a positive and a negative um, aspects of the current. To move the ship and the field has to be large enough to encompass the entire ship once that occurs yeah you know, you've you're not affected by the lines of force outside of that field because they're slipstreaming around the artificial field you're creating when the when the field becomes strong enough they begin to break off and they don't they don't um terminate onto the matter that is the ship the field is protecting them from terminating onto that, the matter that is the ship. And when that happens, suddenly you have a reduction in the effect of both gravity and inertia from outside the ship onto the ship. Now, gravity and inertia, whatever inertia is occurring inside the ship, inside the field, is going to keep doing its thing. You're, you're yeah. not changing that. If you, if you hit your head up against a wall, you're still gonna, it's still gonna hurt. That wall's still gonna stop you. <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if you, you hit your head against the wall, you're still dealing with, with the physics of uh, yeah. that density. You yeah. decide to, to run a, down a corridor and you suddenly want to stop, you're still going to feel the inertial forces of your body wanting to continue going. That's uh, in, inside the ship, it's still, for all appearances, is under Newtonian physics laws. It's just that that field is stopping lines of force outside of that field from terminating and transferring those inertial moments, those inertial um, factors to the ship. Mm -hmm. So you can stop instantly and you won't feel it at all. You can, yeah. you can, you can reach light speed instantly and you won't feel that you've done it. You're not going to yeah, I know the earlier ships, it took them a little while to build up to light speed. Which, that was a function of the engine. It was not a function of a limit to the ability of that the type engine. The reason it took longer is because of the materials being used and the, um, the generators that were used to create the currents. They just weren't as efficient. The materials being used couldn't hold up to as much voltages and whatnot that they can being used today. 
Okay. Which is, it's a material science um, issue. That's all it is. Um, the more um, advanced materials we can get that can hold stronger and stronger voltages, stronger and stronger currents, the great, the stronger we can make the fields. Yeah. And uh, the more they move. And not just that, there's also a, a generator factor, the size of the generator to the size of the mass you're trying to move, mass being the ship. The larger the generator, the larger the field, the less effort it, it's applying to moving that same mass. Yeah, um, in my instruction, they boiled it down to that the negative charge was magnetism and the positive charge was electricity as we know it and the play between the two was what created gravity yeah. and that when you further played with it that you could reverse that effect to eliminate gravity and that that was how <clears throat> the anti-grav engines operated yeah um i've recently remembered i don't know where i learned this from but i it just popped in my head um, about the uh, somewhere I learned about the uh, De Glocka project in my studies, I guess, with the uh, German engineering studies. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the Germans working on a new engine design because they already had better systems in place. Oh, yeah. That well, was Sonora, Sonora Aero Club and um, Schauberger already had better engines than right. Diglocka. That was a completely different project. That was them trying to stabilize the ability to transfer into hyperspace. They were learning how to jump into hyperspace. That's what they were doing with that. Yeah. As a navigator and hyperspace was where I basically became useful. For our audience, a lot of people are using the term hyperspace without defining it. The astral plane. Um, the more actually, with the computer that I was linked with, you had options. Hyperspace is forming a wormhole through another density that might be inhabited. So you needed to be aware of where you were going and what was already there. And you could choose a density, okay? The nature of reality is that things operate at frequencies. Yes. And 3D is a here. And the next major frequency up is what we call the astral plane. And then there are, that would be 4D in standard understanding, and then 5D and 6D. But there are also dimension densities frequencies below 3D yes. and they when you are exactly on frequency they're just as they're solid and real as as you're experiencing this right now exactly and there are beings who inhabit it there are entire ecologies in each one of them and they may or may not look like us but the thing is is even though you're occupying that same frequency, as the density barriers are traversed, um, physics gets tweaked a bit. It, it's yeah. not a complete difference. It's altered um, because, and it's due to the density changes. It's like the same physics, but that physics is operating differently on, on these other densities. Now we, when I was, when I navigate a ship, 
the computer and I have to form a wormhole that's like between frequencies so that we're not interfering with the life there. Right. And it, my understanding is it actually leaves that tunnel behind. What is, um, what's happening is, is every time we create a tunnel, that tunnel is like a scar in the universe. Yeah. Eventually those scars are going to build up. And I know they've addressed this in a Star Trek episode in the next generation. I just can't mm -hmm. remember the episode. Yeah. I remember they had addressed this issue. And yeah, it was holes in holes in hyperspace. Yeah, yeah. Um everywhere that I remember dealing with artificially creating your own wormhole there's patches you can you can design the field generator that you're creating the wormhole with to patch it behind you but it doesn't permanent it doesn't completely close it mm -hmm. so that it's as if that wormhole was never there there's always going to be a scar there yeah and people can people can home home in on that scar and ride it yeah, they can they can ride that scar to go your entire journey. If you now you can literally use those scars as like highways. Mm -hmm. Like now you this path has been created. Now you know the right path to take to to you know get to this say this destination. But at the same time, if you're running from somebody, they can follow you because there's no way you can make that scar invisible. Yeah. There's no way of brushing the foot away. Well, that's why when, when your group talked about that you were in hiding, I'm like, uh, you can't do that. Yeah, and no. you and guys we, argued with me at the time uh -huh. and I'm like, no, you the can memories be- memories we have is they're running. Okay. They're running. And they stole a ship. They stole a ship. Um, mm -hmm. But you're running through hyperspace and you can be tracked through hyperspace. I don't know how they're hiding. I just know that they're on a ship and every time um, the Germans show up or anyone, any branch of the fleet shows up, anytime humans show up, suddenly it's you know, all hands on deck. We need to get out of here. Um, I actually haven't linked to him in a while. That is actually my altar that um, you mentioned was raised by Jura Khan. Mm -hmm. That's that one. Um, he was basically he killed a, Dra uh, a Draco Alpha. A draconian alpha and uh was sent to a um was sent to an arena basically to die in battle i don't know what happened maybe in I just know that i survived each of the battles <clears throat> by the skin of my teeth um not always completely intact but i never died um that's pretty pretty common um and if you had died they could could have just put you in region and brought you back i remember um suddenly waking up because cat had uh she she was the <coughs> she was the group's um high telepath um mm -hmm. that was her role in the group um, and she, you had will and you needed somebody else to be high telepath that's cats far stronger than all of us combined as far as telepathy goes okay she can block a draconian from entering her mind okay that is a high She's telepath the person i've ever met that could do that yeah i can't will basically the ones who what i call the draconian foreign legion <laughs> is basically the 
a lot of the people that the CIA had um, souped up with draconian DNA to screw the Germans. Um, yeah, that was their intention. Before they were, before we were all taken to be mind fractured, we were first abducted by the draconians. They were aware of the program. They would take us first and they would implant an altar of their own making. Their methods were far different. They're so psychic. They can just form a wall in your mind and make a personality instead of having to go through torture and mind fracture. They can just create if they form the wall and it does the same thing of what mind fracture would do of creating an alternate personality mm -hmm. that alternate personality is not something completely of the draconians making so it's still you the same traits that span across all your alters mm -hmm. that are basically soul level traits that come into this life, you come into this life with, mm -hmm. that altar still has. But okay. just like all those other altars, the rest of that is programmable, so is that altar. And um, I met the individual that created that altar's personality, and she called him Michael. Okay. Um, which is boring because that's just my middle name boring okay well, it's, like, it, it's like you couldn't have come up with something better like all you did was was give my all my first altar my altar my middle name um most of my altars have variations of my birth name yeah. so yeah that's what they do and they give you a, a personal id number and then if you're in special programs they'll give you they'll give you uh a number that goes with that program. Um, I have one for DEFCOM. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, that means I can talk to the dead guys, <clears throat> which is important if you're traveling through the land of the dead, which is what 4D is. <laughs> well, it's more annoying when you're trying to sleep. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I gave up on actual sleep a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I sleep lucid. I have since my memories were activated. That was in April of 2013. So That's actually what makes it so easy for you to astral project. See me, I've only done it like three times. Astral projection, it's, I've been... I'm still you, trying. You managed to accomplish it, though. I remember when we first started talking, you were trying and trying and trying, and you just couldn't make that leap out of your body. <clears throat> and you I were remember. asking me, and I'm like, I don't know. I open my eyes. I see. I, I go. I lay down. I, I astral project. I mean, how do I teach this? You know. I remember that one time where I woke up in sleep paralysis, and I'm like, wait, I just just need to get out of my bed. I'm good. I need to get out of my body. And I sat up. I managed to sit up. And at the time, I had a different cat, um, Spartacus. And he's over there by the door, like, just staring at me. He's like, we're making eye contact. I'm sitting up. He's, we're making eye contact. And he's like doing this, you know, that thing that cats do with their shoulders and paws. Uh -huh. and he's doing this. And I'm like, don't you dare. Don't do it. Don't do it. And he runs across my 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 legs, and it this all happened so fast that suddenly I'm sitting up. Suddenly I'm laying back down, sit in you know going to sit up and reach forward and lunge forward, and I grabbed him in, in mid air by the back of his neck. <laughs> Your physical self managed to sit up. And he's he's jumping through your your astral projection. Uh huh. Uh huh. Doing, and the yeah. instant he did that, I I um I was instantly in my body. It happened so fast 
and I'm from the sitting position to the laying position, lunging forward, grabbing him by the back of the neck. <laughs> yeah, and cats still in midair. Jumping cats off really, really hate for their human to go astral. And they, it's a lot they harder can when I have see you do it, and it drives them nuts. I have two cats, and uh, they they've gotten to where that they won't even stay in the bedroom with me. Um, so I think we got so back to engines <clears throat> since we've wandered all over Hell's Half Acre. Yeah, we have. Okay, so where where was I? You were talking, we got as far as the Glocka. Um, yeah, I had remembered that the Glocka was uh, their efforts at learning how to jump into hyperspace, how to manipulate the generators field to phase into a higher density. One thing um, everybody needs to know about the difference of densities is we have this electromagnetic spectrum. What we've been able to measure is so infinitesimally tiny of a spectrum compared to just what's in our own density. Uh -huh. It's so small. And the outer rim of our density of all frequency that we are able that, that to interact with is what we call the light speed barrier, because that's a, that's a frequency barrier. It moves past that. Mm -hmm. And when it moves past that, it transitions suddenly into a much higher um, density state. The, the waves, the magnetic, the electromagnetic waves, they transition into a much denser state. And at each time you move up, each time you reach a density barrier, that same magnetic field, that same electromagnetic field um, is transitioning further into another density. Now, as these density states inside these ranges, so basically each density state has a minimum range and a maximum range. Mm -hmm. And we still haven't reached the bottom minimum range or maximum range of our tech, um, basically mainstream technology at measuring the electromagnetic field. We still yeah. haven't reached those extremes yet. But, uh, what's going on is is you've got physics operates within a you know certain parameters inside this density it physics does certain things and then you move into the next density physics does not change the same physics you're dealing with simply is operating in a different manner because it's in a different environment exactly yeah but your that's how we can go through the bubble the hyperspace tunnel we're in a ship and for us we can still exist in the form we're in yes as long as we remain in the bubble yeah but you step out of the bubble and everything's different oh yeah <clears throat> uh, and it's still our same timeline Yes, we're not talking about different timelines. We're not, and we're actually not talking about other dimensions. Nope. Every dimension that exists all has these same density differences, mm -hmm. higher and lower densities. Yes, sir. So when I hear some of these folks talking about they did this in this dimension and they did this in that density and they did this in this timeline and I'm going, well, that's not how my ship operated. Right. You know, so. For people who are able to teleport on their own um, psionically. I've not quite achieved that yet. I can go and observe right but i can't bring my body there yet yeah um 
there are people who have demonstrated that in the past and there are people who demonstrate that in the programs. Mm -hmm. It feels like that I have that ability in the programs, but for some reason haven't quite figured out how to do it here. Right. I know I remember teleporting short distances in combat, um, which I'm told is extremely difficult. I don't remember doing it long distances. I don't remember, you know, between continents or planets or whatever. I just remember short distances in a close quarters environment, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, making the enemy off balance. So I have a question about that. Since you've done it, does it also leave a scar? Yes. Any of that will leave a scar. A scar is a recording okay. in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's like a memory. Mm. It's the Akashic record type of situation. Everything leaves an imprint. Everything leaves a memory. It's kind of like that. Okay. Only more intense. Because you're jumping between densities. And you need a lot of your own density to do that. So that increase in your own biofields density to give you the oomph to be able to do that is going to leave a much stronger imprint. And that's what we refer to as scars. Okay. It was just a thought that occurred to me. <laughs> well, it allowed me to elaborate on that a little more. All this stuff that I know, it's not always there in the forefront. It's not always linear either. You start talking about one thing and it'll pop up. And you, it could be a topic that would take an entire radio I show all by itself. Everything, the way it's in my head is completely non-linear. Um, it's not, there is no step one, step two, step three. There is, um, this has a relation to this. So now this pops up. You know, suddenly we're talking about this and that relates to another memory I have and then that memory pops up. Mm -hmm. it's, it's through connections. Mm -hmm. Connections are nonlinear. Yeah. All this. And then there are certain topics that I avoid because I get tired of explaining that I'm not a demon. <laughs> <laughs> That was a topic that came up at the last conference. I mean, you know, you start dealing with Roman Catholics and you start dealing with religious fanatics of any stripe and pretty soon you have reached the end of their box and, and anything outside of the box the is a demon. The problem with their box is it's so limited. They mm -hmm. take concepts that they don't even know what that concept really means and they yeah. need a meaning to it. I have come to the understanding that the word demon means you are outside of my box. Yeah, that's the modern take on it. Um, you are outside of my box and um, not part of, you know, I don't agree with what you're saying, basically. Yeah. I, I don't agree with what you're saying and I'm going to be bitchy about it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So That makes yeah. you a demon. But yeah. what a demon really is, is the Latin word uh, deamon, or steamos, something like that, which translates to demigod. And yep. demigod translates to half-breed, meaning half-human, half-extraterrestrial. So basically, demon, deamon, demigod is homo capensis. And there are a few homo capensis around. Yeah. Yeah. Basically the red-haired giants. And their descendants among the humans. Like uh, basically Thoth, Noah, all of them. Yes, I watched your last uh, um, video. <laughs> yeah, I've been kind of busy having a... <laughs> that made so much, all that made so much perfect sense to me. Like, yeah. 
given my past research into, you know, Noah and uh, my heavy research into Thoth, who was just who was actually an Atlantean, and turns out all of the Atlanteans were the red-haired giants. Yeah. Uh, who, you know, the red-haired giant's actual scientific name is Homocapensis. Yeah, I... I, I we I, have a scientific name for them, but technically they don't exist, do they? <laughs> Officially, so, they don't exist, but yet we have a scientific name for them. Someone came up with a scientific name for them. Why would they do that if they don't exist? Yeah. And that's back to being outside the box. I was born with both black and red hair. My dad's a full-blown ginger. Um, I was born with dark hair. And it rubbed out and came in platinum blonde. And in my early teens, it started getting darker and darker and darker. And it was actually ash blonde until oh, probably about 15 years ago. I started noticing that it was red in the sunlight. And now, I have streaks of gray. It shows sometimes in, in the, the videos. Um, um, the top of my head was like a 10% even saturation of red hair all of this you see all this white right here mm -hmm. this was a 50 50 black and red even saturation all this right here i'm told that around my lip line in the sunlight you can still see some red hair uh, i have a, a light bulb in in the lamp that is one of those um sunlight spectrum bulbs and so you know the light hits me and my hair looks red and i'm sitting here looking at it you know no it doesn't look red in real life it looks like the other side that's that's brownish with gray streaks and i'm like where where did that red come from <clears throat> mm -hmm. we're, we're not gonna go into that today are we <laughs> i guess we should go back get back up onto the topic the okay yeah. <clears throat> we uh, have discussed have a tendency to bunny trail we have discussed townsend brown yeah introduced his name so why is he important to the story because he figured out about the voltage connection to gravity He's the one on the American side that figured it out. Literally, the story goes that he was in school one day and they were um, playing with, I think it was a particle accelerator, and they pulsed some DC. It was these real thick wires, heavy, like heavy wires, and they were pulsing some DC current through it, and the wire would jump, physically jump and move, and jump around. And he's like, what the hell's going on here? And he's the one that studied and figured out that if you apply an asymmetrical function to DC current, it manipulates gravity. And he developed his arrows or whatever, I think, um, it's these, basically, it was these saucer-shaped discs mm. on this platform. I, I forget I forget the name of them. Uh, he was working with someone, I believe, Otis Carr. And they built the saucers. Um, my friend drew, he got married and they hyphenated their names. It, it used to be Drew Dowling. Yeah. And he has, he has a website where he talks about the physics behind the Otis Carr. He and I had many conversations on that subject. Yeah, he's, he's an incredible man. And one of the few that I have had to just tell him point blank, look, dude, you're over my head. I'm having to stretch, chill, 
It's not, it's not that you're stupid. It's that I can't keep up. He and I, we, he, when we do talk about it, we're always challenging each other and not in a, you know, I challenge you kind of way, but it's just his understanding and my understanding are completing the picture, you know, yeah. he more, he has a stronger understanding of the actual engineering side. Mm -hmm. And I have a stronger understanding of the electrical theory side mm -hmm. and we complete each other. Well, he has built um, his own Tesla coil. Yeah, he built his own Tesla, Tesla coil, and it and it's that supplying electric traps that people play with, but an actual one. Yeah, he he built one, not one of the little toy ones, but an actual one that's big enough to supply energy to a house. And he he was one of them that came up with the concept of a negative energy. And basically, that's what we talked about. If you can reverse the polarity, then you create an anti-grav effect. Right. And he found that the negative energy was produced by the Tesla coil and that that actually was what was running his house, that the positive energy tended to shut it off. Yep. Yeah. Um... Speaking of that function of the Tesla coil, I was actually surprising the last few months a new kind of uh, engine design that I've been remembering um, that involves the same concept of, you know, that uh, the sonic speaker toy that you play with and it's got two speakers and they create a... Uh, uh, a phase variance that's slightly off from each other and you can put a ball there and it just sits there. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, I've almost figured out how you can do that with a magnetic field. Wow. Um, you should be able to. It, require, it requires a similar setup to what Tesla was working with. Um, and it Basically, it's that third coil that he was working with is what you really want to um, play with. The rest of the other two coils are not actually really necessary. It's the specific geometry of his third coil. Okay. See, the toys people play with were the two coil setup and, and not actually what Tesla was working with. Yeah. This was another guy. This was a completely different guy that was at one of Tesla's um, conferences one time as he was um, lecturing about his discoveries and research and his apparatus. And this guy got several concepts wrong and he went with it and made a toy out of it. And that's what everybody is calling Tesla coil today. Yeah, I knew that what they were using. I've I've seen the videos where that they have the the static charge coming out and, and dancing on people that have metallic over clothes. Tesla was trying to eliminate all that because mm -hmm. that creates losses. That is loss in the current. Yeah, he was trying is. to use that current, not play with it. Yeah. He would sit there and and have a light bulb without anything else, just the light bulb sitting there and he's reading by the light bulb. He was actually using the current. Yes. He had so. figured out how to completely arrest those uh, streams of uh, electricity running through the air. Um, he figured out all kinds of stuff. He figured out how to control the temperature of the atmosphere around the field just by changing the frequency in his device. Well, isn't that how they do air conditioning on ships with the Germans is yes. through through the frequent the frequency, frequency of yeah. And we produce light from sound frequencies yes. that um, I remember the panels on the sides of the rooms and that between them 
you would get the light from the sound frequency bouncing between the two terminals. Yes. When the frequency of the sound, when the compression, basically it's a compressive wave. When you're dealing with a medium, the wave is not like you see on an oscilloscope. That's just a representation of what's going on between a compressed side and an uncompressed side yeah. of the wave. When the compression reaches a certain um, density to equal, let's say, the frequency of a particular spectrum of light, then light suddenly emits from that point. Yeah, and it will em it will emit at a specific frequency, which is the photon release. This is a similar thing that's actually how the tractor beam systems work. The, you know how when you stand under a craft and it kind of tractors you up? Mm -hmm. What's The light isn't actually, the light is just the beam of light that tells you where the field starts and ends. That's all that is. That's not Yeah, hard. it's like, okay. We have this field. How are we going to know where it is? Let's shine a light on it. Yeah, they're, they're shining the light right through the beam. Um, and what the beam is, is an electromagnetic wave of a certain um, type, more like how Tesla was dealing with, um, where um, one end is higher compression. It's a, it's a unidirectional wave. Um, one end is hot, more compressed than the other end, and that's creating an asymmetrical direction, just like a cap asymmetrical capacitor. You're doing the exact same thing. Now, if you've got the front end of the of the compressive wave at a higher density than the back end, gravity is going to move in the direction that the wave is is moving. If you that would be a sawtooth wave on the oscilloscope of the, the long flat end of the sawtooth on the front end of the wave, and then it curves down. That is the less dense back end of the wave. Now, let's say you reverse that on the oscilloscope. It would be you're building up. And then you get that you get that high spike and you go straight down on the on the sawtooth um, on the oscilloscope. What's happening is you're building up density until you reach that peak density and it pulses. Mm -hmm. And what you've got there is now the wave is moving in this direction, the beam in this direction, but because you have the compressed side of of the pulse. The pulse is an asymmetrical frame where, where you've got the compressed side is, is higher density than the front end. The back end is now the higher density. Gravity is going to, even though the beam is moving in this direction, gravity is going to move in this direction. Now you can tractor things to you. And if you have a system that can reverse that and have um, opposite sawtooths uh, waves back to back with each other. You can hold objects right there in place. You're basically yeah. pushing and pulling at a constant, even rate and holding the object there in place. Uh, that's what I remember doing with large rocks before we would drop them on a planet. We would tractor you beam them. And hold on to them and take uh -huh. them. We, we would pull them into a position and just hold them there while we did negotiations with, with the Draco and the rebellious folks. And <clears throat> they would know that we had their destruction in, in place. And they, would, they got to where when they stop, saw my armada come in that they would surrender to the Draco immediately. They did not want to deal with my group at all. That was the group that Joseph and I were both officers in, Joseph Powell. We would come in and we would destroy the place. There would be absolutely nothing left. Just an asteroid belt. 
pretty much. So, um, yeah, I am well aware of what large rocks dropped from space can do. So, let's see. There was something else I wanted to mention along with that. Okay. We talked about the anti-grav engines. We talked about Tesla coils. Did you want to talk about the EM drive? Or as I know it, the copper microwave drive? Well, that kind of, that conversation went towards um, explaining a lot of the misconceptions about what some of these people who have come into the media and observed, you know, like say, um, what's his name? That um, Lazar, Bob Lazar, okay. what he observed, I, I remember ships like that and they don't quite function exactly the way he described. Yeah. It's literally his description to me was a really freaking high tech EM drive. Yeah. You got the big cavity underneath the shuttle craft. That's what they were. They were that he was looking at. He was looking at shuttle craft. You've got the shuttle craft that he was referring to use element 115 and element 115 when bombarded by other atoms through a particle accelerator does not produce gravity waves they produce electromagnetic waves mm -hmm. these electromagnetic waves can be channeled through superconducting conduits the conduits he's referring to that could channel gravity waves were simply superconductive surfaces that kept the electromagnetic waves bottled up inside the uh, channel. That's mm. what that was. Well, Bob Lazar was dealing with um, a captured ship yeah. and they were reverse engineering this, this and they, ship. they didn't understand the technology and he, it, he was describing their attempts to figure it out. The big but cavity the was first the time. Cavity. The first time I saw one of these Elon Musk ships that formed the teardrop shaped field and the spiral inside it, I knew he was he was using he was testing an EM drive. That's exactly what he was doing. So, um, <clears throat> in fact, I I sat there and said. That's a copper microwave engine. <laughs> I know. I remember you texted it to me, and I went and looked at looked it up, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah that EM drive that NASA's playing with." That's yeah. that. Yeah, that's that. And if and looked up the 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 currents, the that you're feeding into the microwave generator. Yeah, it's gonna do that. Yeah, you you. That's what it does. The reason and, they're able to say, is able to say, oh, it's only able to move so much. It's only able to do this and that because they're 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 putting milliwatts. Yeah. The you put millions of watts or billions of watts through a microwave generator that can handle that much power, and that ship is going to reach escape velocity very quickly. Uh, that engine it was the basic engine in most of the ships I was I was navigator on. You see, the Zeta ship that the that was at um, what did they call that facility? S four some Groom Lake. Yeah, basically Groom Lake. <clears throat> that, ca that cavity um, that was the under half of the ship had those three emitters, those were microwave emitters. They channeled the microwaves. Basically, they had a more efficient way of producing microwaves simply by bombarding element 115 with a particle accelerator instead of creating microwaves the way we do. That's all that was, it's a microwave generator. But microwaves were um, 
just cleaner, basically. Yeah, they're cleaner than a lot of the other things that are used. They, it was it was a lot cleaner um, waves, basically. I I don't remember the exact details of it. I just I just know I remember be, um, no, understanding that this way of producing microwaves is produces a cleaner signal than than the way we do here. And when you have three emitters and it's able to, they're able to move around and they bombard the bottom end and the way they bounce off the walls and the way they bounce off each other waves creates asymmetrical aspects to the field that's being generated to surround the ship. And those asymmetrical aspects allows the ship to tilt and move and mm -hmm. travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to be able to direct it. Otherwise, you end up with smaller engines that you basically like on a submarine. Yeah. Um, because, uh, guys, you don't have traction in space. You can't apply the brakes. <laughs> um, so I remember what I was going to get at. Um, Basically, a lot of these field generators are using superconductive surfaces and applying magnetic field generation to that surface to amplify the density of the field being generated. Literally, what's going on is, now let's take into account the ARV alien reproduction vehicle, which is basically like a, it's the Americans take on a German um, Hanadu 4 engine. Four yeah. Is that. It, the, that, was, that was literally blueprints that the Germans gave the Americans um, and they worked it out. That was their first rendition of making those blueprints work. And what it is, is what the theory is, is when the mercury is atomized and superheated and put under high pressure at a certain point under a certain pressure at a certain temperature, mercury becomes a plasma. When mercury becomes a plasma, it becomes superconductive. When mercury becomes superconductive, what we understand of superconductivity is what, what mainstream science tells the public what superconductivity is, is electrons are moving in a different way that allows them to travel along the conductor with zero resistance. Yeah. But what's really going on is the electrons in the matter that is the superconductive material are cohering themselves in a way where they're no longer siphoning energy off of the magnetic field. You see, when you have heat in, in a circuit, those are the electrons siphoning power off of the field that you're generating. You have losses. As long as yeah. if you have heat, you have losses. Yeah, heat is, heat is a loss. Generated, you have zero losses. And what's happening is, is those electrons are, are being caused to do something else and leave the field alone. And when that happens, that field is now being repelled and it's no longer, it's no longer making a connection. So now it's slipstreaming around the surface it's able to do so without the need of the electrons trying to grab it and steal from it. So now it's slipstreaming all throughout that surface unencumbered. Yeah. Without touching the surface. So that's what's going on there. If you have a surface that is, let's say, a superconductive surface that is now spinning, well, that's going to cause that field to increase at that point of where that surface is, it's gonna increase in density because believe it or not, magnetic lines of force have friction. 
mm -hmm. have a frictional factor to them. And so they're going to constantly start to build and build and build in density and number of lines of force that are trying to adhere to that surface, but they're not able to. And so that's what they call their magnifying core. That's what the mercury is for. You can do that solid state too without having the need of, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, without the so, need. So they didn't, I didn't understand how all the engines operated, but I did understand that the vortex engines created so much radiation that the crews usually died from radiation sickness and that that had to be overcome in the later ships. So valid state, but uh, how, how did they accomplish that? Because otherwise it was the spin. Yeah, first I want to explain um, where that radiation is really coming from. That radiation is coming from the specific mercury based material they're using to create the plasma. See what's happening is, is when mercury is superheated and um, they're using high currents to create the heat to create the uh, density they need. And what's happening is, is it's undergoing fusion in there. That plasmic um, mercury is undergoing fusion. And when apparently when mercury undergoes self-fusion, meaning there's no other objects to fuse with it, it turns into gold. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that that was a big problem. They would be going along just fine and suddenly the mercury would, would okay. transmute itself into gold and then they'd just fall out of the sky because gold doesn't have that same property. Right. Um, now, monoatomic gold does have a superconductive property to it, but that's a different... It's mm. a different field geometry of the atom itself. Yeah, most gold has a three atom, ge no, eight atom geometry. And monoatomic is you're separating all of those into in two separate atoms. What people um, need to realize is, is mainstream science sees the periodic table as that's what's it. Uh, the atom can only look like this and can only function this way when you go out into space and they'll take one atom and create a dozen different things with it and we're not talking about isotopes we're yeah. talking about actual field geometry changes and when you change the geometry of the atomic field of that atom you're changing its properties Mm -hmm. and that's what happens when regular gold gets turned into monoatomic gold. And why it's called monoatomic gold is because when it changes into that, that monoatomic geometry, it can no longer bind anything. You actually have to superheat it and turn it into a ceramic. Yes, monoatomic gold when superheated and remade into a, a larger macro object is a glass-like ceramic with a goldish tint to it. And that is room temperature, full on room temperature superconductivity. Um, I remember seeing that glass. It's also a lot lighter. It's actually manipulating because of its specific geometry um, atomic geometry and its superconductivity, it has its own gravity manipulating properties. By itself, it'll lose about 40% of its weight, even though you're still dealing with the same number of atoms. Hmm. And if you pulse some, some high voltage through it, you can actually enhance that effect. Um, Bismuth for one. Bismuth is another one. When you, you break down the surfaces, um, let's say you get down to like, I think it was like 
three to five microns in thickness, the atoms start to change their nature and become superconductive. And the geometry is also changing. They have an asymmetrical aspect to their geometry. And when they're, when they're running in superconductive mode, they're all pointed in precisely the same direction. Mm -hmm. So now you have a single asymmetrical field being pulsed in the same direction. I know carbon when it's when it's set up as graphene will have superconductive qualities to it. But it is so rare to find graphene in nature that that they were just playing with the ideas. I've been hearing a lot of talk about a synthetic graphene that's been developed. It takes some effort to produce it and uh, it's more fragile than they want than they say. Yeah. They're, they're talking about how extremely strong it is. Well that's that's by weight and mass that yeah. strength is. We're not we're talking about you can still poke your finger through it. Well, the graphene that, that was used in <clears throat> what used to be called cat whisper tuck, um, that was so thin that it was thinner than paper is. And yeah, you put, you can put your finger through it. So but, you say how that, that graphene is like, a hundred thousand times stronger than steel. That's if you made steel a single atom layer structure, just like graphene. It would yeah. be stronger than that steel. Yeah, not <laughs> not a steel beam. So extremely, just as hard as it is to make graphene, it's far far harder to stack it into a macro-sized object that could actually be that strong. Yeah. But um, I've been hearing a lot of talk about graphene being the same thing as black goo. And that is not not by any means because graphene is is an atomic structure of carbon and black goo it, are nanobots. What I understand black goo to be is um, if you took not exactly nanobots, as in microscopic, sub-microscopic uh, rigid machines, but more of if you took um, pliable metal um, alloys or other, other atomic um, minerals and configure in a certain way to where you've got more of like a smart metal that can move around, become liquid. Um, this object would, is more of a, a gel-like substance, but it can create um, artificial neural link, linkages to where it can, it can actually process information, but mm -hmm. it can also move itself in a way that allows it to grab and do things on the subatomic level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but I'm hearing a lot of people e equate black goo with graphene and that's not, that's not a real thing. No. It's totally in the realm of somebody pulled it out of his ass and everybody that else ran with it. One of the things I've noticed about black goo is if you heat it up enough, it breaks apart into its most basic constituent components. And nanobots could handle more than that. Uh, but nanobots can only go so far down the scale. Yeah. Well, some species must have figured out how to reach that smaller scale by cohering certain elements that react with each other in certain ways that allow itself to dynamically, it's like a living circuit board. That's a good description for it. 
my understanding of black goo was that it originally it originated in another galaxy uh, three or four galaxies ago that it brings the organic life form up to a technological level to support it, that it then creates an AI body that matches the organic life form that created it. And so for basically three, four generations of that life form, they make it heaven on earth and then they sl the they slowly eliminate. they slowly eliminate every organic life form on that planet and then they then it will go to the next one and it's basically like terminator but if the humans were a frog in a pot and you were slowly raising the temperature yes and it has done this in at least 3 complete galaxies so the germans in space and the draconian empire are playing with fire using this for anything they are and to my that's, understanding it's kind in, in the in the draconian empire it's kind of like um some there are parties in the empire that don't approve of it and there are parties that in that are um, pushing for it. Uh, they think they can control news. it. They are, the groups that, that are pushing for it are arrogant enough to think they can control it. And um, my contacts with the Guardians have made it very clear that this is a situation that will not be tolerated because it's a risk to all organic life in, in this galaxy. That it, they're, not, they're not going to tolerate it at all. And there are deposits of it on Earth that have been used throughout history. There are deposits of it that are older than before the Draconians ever um, came mm -hmm. here. Yeah, the black, the sentient black goo is is older than this galaxy. Yes. Now this galaxy is actually, they talk, um, scientists talk about our galaxy being one of the larger ones we know of. Mm. The reason for that is because the galaxy is about three galaxies that have combined into one. Uh huh. Um, the most recent one, I can't remember the name of it, but Earth actually came from the most recent um, that, Yeah, that it, we're, that galaxy is still in the process of being absorbed, and it's almost yeah. completely absorbed. But the next possible. one to be absorbed is Andromeda. Yeah. And it's, it, they're talking about a billion years before it interacts to the point of of being absorbed. Yeah, I mean, it's still 4 million light years away. Yeah. But uh, it that distance is actually shortening. I mean, ever so slowly, in a billion years, they'll be touching. And that's what that's what the scientists mean by um, absorption in a billion years. At the rate it's it's coming, we're, we're colliding with each other will start to touch and be uh, and share um, stellar systems in about a billion years. Yeah. But this has happened twice before. Mm -hmm. Just the fact of life. And we're it's, it's see... everything out there that has, oh, how do I put this so I don't sound religious? Everything in 3D reality in this timeline that has life eats something else. Right. And that applies to gal stars and galaxies and as well. Supermassive um, black hole objects will merge together to become an even larger one. That's and why the ours, they say ours is, is larger than they thought. 
they say ours is larger than other ones they've seen. Well, that's because we're three galaxies that merged together. And so did those black holes merge together. Mm -hmm. And another one coming in about a yep. billion years. And the bigger and, it gets, the more it'll suck. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe 100 or 200 million years after the two galaxies make contact is when those two black holes will begin to merge. Yeah. The, the universe is far older than mainstream science is saying it is. Because mm -hmm. they're still using Einsteinian physics to calculate all that. Yeah. And Earth, standard Earth physics is not going to make any progress until they dump relativity. Yep and go back to the electronics theories before that. And the government is allowing relativity to be set in stone because they don't want Earth normals to figure out how to get into space. They don't want, they don't want to share. They don't want the competition. Exactly. So, um, okay, we covered, we covered anti-grav, we covered repulsing, we, Oh, we you wanted me to go into, uh, the solid state units. Yes. I wanted to do the solid state units because those intrigue me. Those will make the next subject matter. Um, basically they're crystalline but when people in our community talk about crystal engines, they think about these high tech, you know, artistic things that are just made of, everything's made of crystal. And that's oh. not true. Yeah, I was at a conference in, in the spring where there was this, this supposed technology and it was quartz crystals tied together with copper wiring. No, no. Just no. <laughs> they uh, uh, put it to you this way: um, barium titanate is a crystalline sub um, um, object, even though it's a ceramic, because it it crystallizes, um, and then you heat it up, and you know, it's both basically, because it's a piezo, it's a ceramic that is piezoelectric. Uh, folks, a piezoelectric means that you push on it and it gives out electricity. You or apply you pressure. Electricity, it vibrates. Mm -hmm. Either or. Um, piezovoltaic, I believe. No, not voltaic. I, I forget. But there's one where if you apply a thermal energy to it, it will apply um, electricity or a vibration yeah, it'll apply a vibration if you apply thermal energy, and if you apply pressure, it will apply therm it'll produce thermal energy, something like that. There's even one um, like the the calcite, the micro calcite crystals in your pineal gland, when they're bombarded by um, it, ultra extreme high frequency waves, and we're talking about waves that our current technology cannot detect at this time as far as mainstream science goes. These frequencies when they bombard a calcite crystal um, to a high enough density, that calcite crystal will create photons. And the pineal gland has the same light sensors that your eyeballs has. And that's when people start to see ghosts around, see people in other dimensions or astral project and remote view, ESP, look into the past or the future. That's what's happening. Those crystals are activating and yeah. you have removed the calcification of your pineal gland enough to where those light receptors can now do their job. And while it's doing that, it gives you DMT. 
yes, it will produce a chemical called DMT that the ancient uh, cultures referred to as the death chemical. That's because when you're born, it pops you alive. And when you die, it's what releases you from the body. And in between, it's what gives you visions and psychic abilities. DMT, the chemical, the field that the calcite crystals are creating that your spirit latches onto, basically possessing this body when, when you're born. Um, that's the moment when the pineal gland lights up first and you start to kick and everything um, and all that. You've, you have, a spirit has possessed this infant's body and no, this is not a demonic thing. This is you. You possess the physical body yeah. and that you lock into that, those um, calcite crystals the specific geometries of the crystals allow you to do this, allows your body to, allows the physical body to merge with the energy frequencies of the spirit body. Mm -hmm. The chemical of the DMT reacts with the calcite crystals in such a manner that it allows a disconnect of those energy frequencies, allowing you to disconnect from the body now, depending on the amount of DMT, you will go, you will either astral project or you will die, meaning full on disconnect from the body. And that's yeah, as, as long as you still have that silver cord, you're just astral, astral projecting. That silver cord is actually the frequencies of those calcite crystals holding mm. on, still maintaining an actual connection to the energy patterns of your spirit body, maintaining that connection, no matter where you go in all of the universe, any dimension, any density, or even through time, you're still locked into those calcite crystals of that pineal gland of your body until the DMT when you die, they've been, able, they've been able to measure that the release of DMT at the moment of death is extreme and it saturates the body. It starts at the pineal gland and it's only then does the brain activity cease. It's only upon the release of the DMT that the brain activity ceases, meaning the connection between the spirit body and the physical body. Well, having been dead seven times on in the here and now and been sent back seven times, I will tell you, it may hurt leaving, but it hurts just as bad coming back. And they don't fix the body. If it's, I'm wondering if it's different for everybody because my mom has died three times and she said her experiences were completely painless hmm maybe it would have to be different for everybody i i would guess based on on soul origin she has died under her last three children's births before me she died each at each birth and was resuscitated um I was the only one bore that she didn't die over. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> also, wow. <laughs> but I also put her in labor at six months and they kept her chemically uh, recessed for another two months. And I was born a month premature. She stayed in basically in the labor um, moment for two months. They kept chemically holding her back until I, until I could hold myself on my own, you know. And uh, I was born. Poor mama. Hmm? Poor mama. Yeah. She likes to tell me that I gave her all the trouble before I was born. After the after I was born, there was no trouble at all. <laughs> That's not what my mama says about me. 
So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> oh, well. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, back to the solid state stuff. Keep I, mean, I keep bugging Trey on the camera. It is what it is. I guess it'll make for a good show. I think it's making a great show. We have about 20 more minutes. Oh, wow. We've been on that long? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll try to get uh, what I can in there. Um, so basically, these solid state crystalline materials are used to create superconductivity. That's all they're used. The crystal font part creates superconductivity at a room temperature. Basically, no need for the giant coolers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Make a smaller unit, more efficient unit. That, that's it. Yeah, I remember you talking about one engine was about the size of a football, and I was like, what? <laughs> no, that wasn't the engine. That was the fusion generator I was talking about. Oh, okay. You make the fusion generator that I was looking at the size of a football, and it would power, you know, something like an F-22. Um, but yeah, um, so you've got a field, you've basically got a magnetic field generator, which would be a coil of some sort. It's the way we go about it. If you looked at the ARV, it's got this coil system in there that's literally dipped in some sort of dielectric crystal. Mm -hmm. It's possibly a piezoelectric as well, um, but it looks like it was like a single dip. It, it, and then comes out solid one piece. Um, and it also could be multiple coils because the way it looks stacked, it looks like it could be multiple coils. But anyway, you're creating a field, a magnetic field with these coils, basically a high voltage air coil field like Tessa was playing with. Okay. The superconductor in the core at the center creates the magic. It takes that field, it takes the field lines and amplifies them, increases their density. As their density is increased, a shielding effect um, occurs where you're shielding against other four fields, other um, lines of force that want to terminate onto the mass that is your ship and cause inertia or gravity to take effect. Well, if those things are slipstreaming around your craft, now your craft is not affected by outside gravity or outside inertia to a degree. As the field increases, increases in density, that effect becomes stronger and stronger. It's not a, it's not a perfect field and you don't want it to be because if it was a perfect field, you blip out of this density because you're basically, as you're increasing field density, you're increasing frequency. Yeah. And while you're at it, there are space critters that, that see that as a glowing- Buffet. Dinner. Yeah. Yeah, you dinner. You there? Okay. You popped out, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm still here. Okay, so yeah, I, I, as navigator, I've had to deal with a lot of space critters that thought the ship was dinner, and and some of the fields, like you describe, end up just being a, a beacon saying, "I'm here," and yeah. so countermeasures have to be used every so often to to basically you're just yeah you're, you're altering the frequency of the field or the phase variance of the field so that it becomes unpalatable unappetizing to them and they they just yeah. go away i think star trek called it souring the milk pretty much so yeah you'd be surprised how much you know Gene Rodberry was in the know. Uh, I think he knew a lot about Solar Warden. I don't think he knew so much about the the Knoxwaffen programs. 
I knew he. I know he was aware of Nachtwaffen. Well, yeah, that's who he called the Vulcans. <laughs> yeah, the Vulcans and the Romulans. Yeah, the Vulcans and Romulans. <clears throat> For the record, the Federation on Star Trek is Solar Warden. The the Vulcans and Romulans are Nachtwaffen. The Ferengi are planetary corporations, AKA the Alliance and ICC. So yeah, everybody that's, that has a human faction out there was represented in the Star Trek universe. And I have to say the Klingons had to be either Monarch or Kruger or both. Klingons? Yeah. Oh no, they were the Draco. I really don't think so. The, I mean, the, the Klingons were so obviously the Draco. And um, no, Kruger were the Borg because okay. they so enhance their, their assets that you can't Sandy find the human underneath. So. Then Monarch. What would Monarch be? Uh, Monarch are shot full of black goo, but they look human. So I don't, I don't know who they would have been. You think they could have been? Uh, what is that? Um, Sector six or Sector twenty one? Something. What did they call that? Uh, the spy um, section of uh, Starfleet. Oh uh, yeah, could have been them. Always controlling everything. Or trying to. Yeah. What I have found with humans, both here and there, we're not generally controllable. We always manage to, you know, free ourselves somehow. We're just the parts of everybody that we have in us, as far as all the different races made us very uh, ingenuitive. Now that seems to be resourceful. That seems uh, to be our best quality is we're resourceful and adaptable. We learn quickly. Uh Uh-huh. We may not be as high IQ as they are, but we can take their toys and create real tech out of it. We can take their toys and do stuff with it they didn't even realize because they just don't think the way we do. Exactly. Because our IQ may be lower doesn't mean they can think the way we do. Yeah. We, we may see patterns between things that they never thought to look at. Yeah. I've always seen that about us, no matter what branch we are, what we're doing, or what our motive is. We tend to take things that they think are little kids' toys and we'll make weapons out of them. Uh huh. That they didn't even realize was actually possible. Uh huh. Take engines that they hand us that are hand me downs that are the lowest, oldest in tech and we'll surpass them with new ideas, modifications we've made. We'll soup them up like race cars. No joke. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Tim the tool, tool man applied to, <laughs> applied to old junk spaceships. Uh-huh. That's exactly <laughs> what we do. <laughs> Sorry, kids. If you haven't seen Tim, Tim the tool man, you, you need to. <laughs> I grew up with that show that that's basically what what we behave like is is we get something that sort of works and we figure out how to modify it do we we soup it up put a high engine on it and go and inevitably it blows up but we learn something learn something new and then we try again and then the next time and then maybe the seventh time down the way it works and works amazingly well. And then, and then the people who handed us this childish, old, outdated tech 
are having their jaws are just dropping at how we're able to do this. It's like they're dumber than we are. How are they doing this? Exactly. They're they're stupid. How how are they doing this? How are how are they coming up with this? They're, it's it's as if the way they see us is as if monkeys in the in the forest, chimpanzees or whatever, suddenly had coil guns. Yeah. Um, I, I was shown, I asked one of the beings I interact with, I go, so what, what are we really? What do you guys see us as? And I got this picture of a ranch with a jungle that some of the ranch is jungle and some of it, they're growing what they want and that there's monkeys, not even chimpanzees, monkeys, the ones with tails that are obnoxious. Gotcha. That the monkeys started building houses and farming. <laughs> and the monkeys started building cars and factories. And, and said, that's how they see us as the monkeys are doing this. And I'm like, and why are you talking to me? And it's because you're one of the monkeys that can hear us. Of course, we're going to talk to you. <laughs> we want to know what you guys are up to. Well, duh, we're evolving. We're going to the next step. You either deal with us or you don't, you know. <laughs> I've always seen it as they are, you know, other species will incarnate here as humans. And it's like, what, what would the point be if they thought we were these lowly things that they could just, they were just going to mow over that just they're, they're ruining the galaxy, as some people say. The thing is, is if you have to look at it logically, why would they uh, put the effort into trying? It's because they actually see potential. Oh, yeah, they see potential in us. Um, what I've been told is that we're all going to be brought back to the solar system and sealed in. Now, yeah. you know, there's an Oort cloud that's, yeah. that's 360 everywhere. It's not just a flat <laughs> surface. It's all the way around. And so the outside of the Oort cloud is going to be sealed off. And the two portals that lead outside the solar system are going to be cut off. So we are going to be cut, trapped in here with all of the other races that live in the solar system. And we are going to be kept here until we learn to get along with each other. So the monkeys have to stop fighting. Well, on that note, I've personally been invited back by the uh, by the mantids on Mars. Awesome. I was invited back. I was like, why would I want to go back to Mars? <laughs> but, Mars was actually not a bad place when we weren't at war. I've linked with the hive mind of the mantids on Mars. Um, now, that is a real interesting experience. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, it's like they evaluated me and I was basically reaching out to anybody who was not a dickhead out there. And <laughs> all the were dickheads. And so they kind of stepped in saw my ping, stepped in, um, evaluated me, and like, you know, we like you. you we'll let you back. We'll, we'll invite you back. If you, is that if you can make it here, we'll, we'll invite you in. That's cool. They were, um, very, they were very friendly about it. Um, there was a... They actually said that they forgive me for what I was forced to do against my will. Cool. There was a group of, a different group of, of mantids that were involved in a war with a reptilian group, not the Draco. 
Yeah. The, uh... And they were not on Mars, these guys. And the that particular mantid group, their home world was destroyed. So they were left with these six ships full of what was left of their people. <clears throat> and when they contacted me, they wanted to make contact with the Nachtwaffen, Oberkommando, yeah, I, I command, because they needed some place to live. They were overcrowded, not enough food, blah, blah, blah. It was telepathic contact. And I'll tell you, I will never forget the emotional carrier wave that went with the contact. This was a plea for help. It was a desperate plea for help. But the carrier wave was, they were summoning a demon because they were that desperate. Well, that's what they see some of us as. Yeah, well, I haven't been a nice person out in space. So that's how they were seeing me was as a demon and someone who had destroyed worlds. And I was literally their last resort. And yeah, I connected them up with, with high command and yeah, they were given a small planet and a small jungle world, perfect for their needs, a little bit on the small side, but you know, okay. and uh, they were, they were just shocked. It was, why are you helping us when you were so nasty before? And I said, we're not at war anymore. And it's what? I go, I was doing my job. Uh, I'm not at war at you now. Why why would I why would I do any you any harm? And that was a real insight into humanity for them. Yeah, um, the the mantid I connected to on Mars was actually the one that had saved me from that plane crash. Cool. Um, when I got caught in the storm on Mars and my plane crashed, he was the one that pulled me out and uh, and you know helped me into a cave away from the storm. And when the storm passed, um, he helped me limp to the nearest human settlement. That's really cool. He was the one I linked to when, um, when they connected. And um, to experience their hive mind is really interesting it's not like the borg no I, I have mind it's not the there's a queen but it's more like the queen uh, manages the consensus yeah um does not manage each individual each individual has a personality still now that personality is a combination of things, a combination of the unique personality soul that comes in with their own traits. And those traits, um, you know, evolve that personality into its own uniqueness. But then you've also got their, their hive mind where they have no need for a school-based education. You need to learn mm -hmm. how to use this computer that's in the hive mind. You just download it. Yeah. What struck me, though, about the mantids on Mars was how regimented their life was for each individual. They had a role. They filled their role. They never even considered the possibility of adapting to something else because right. that was their function. Right. And that's kind of what happens when you reach that point of hive mindedness. Yeah, and, and I thought about if those, if that kind of a mindset for ever took over Earth, what that would do to humanity to be subjected to that. That, that has been, you know, it's, it's one of those things, yeah, it works for them, but 
it wouldn't would not work for us. No. Anyway, we are at the end of our time. Is there any way you want to let folks contact you? Um, I've been I've actually thought about that. I was thinking about making a new email or something because uh, people have tried contacting me through Facebook, but they'll just send me a, a friend request and they'll never send a message. And I don't yeah. answer. I don't accept friend requests if I don't know you. Uh, if if we haven't had a conversation where I've gotten to know you, I'm not going to accept your friend request. Um, yeah, I've gotten to where I get so many people just send me their experience without any context to it or any consideration for my time. Right. It's it's they'll contact me at four o'clock in the morning and expect me to stay up and talk to them for eight hours. I I have no problem. Um, you know, answering questions or developing, you know, friendships, um, um, you know, letting people pick my brain. It's going to be on my time and I have a very extremely <laughs> work schedule. Yeah. I only have one day a week and that one day a week is filled with chores. So it's like very, my, my communication would be very sporadic and on my time. But uh, if you're not going to, you know, actually initiate a contact and, and communicate with me, I'm not going to accept a friend request. Okay. Um, on that note, I need to let folks know that this is the last fresh show that I will be doing before I have cervical spinal fusion surgery. And I will be offline, the doctor says, two to four months. So <clears throat> I've got plenty in the archive and the Global Enlightenment Radio Network will have lots of other shows in the meantime. So thank you for coming. And thank, my, thank you, audience, for listening and signing off.